why do we need GMOs at all? This is Star Talk, and I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, and I'm also the director of New York City's Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History. And I've got with me my coach, Chuck Nice. Hey, hey. Chuck and baby. How are you still you, tweeting at Chuck Nice Comic. That's right. Love at your Chuck stuff. Nice Just love Thanks. your stuff. I see in weird places, and but the weird fun places all the time on TV. Yes. It's great. Exactly. That's, you should just show up in places. That's pretty much my whole career. Weird fun places on TV. It's like, where's Waldo? It's like, where's yeah, Chuck where's today? Chuck? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so today, I don't know if we're talking about the science of GMOs. And today we're featuring my interview with film director Scott Kennedy. And he directed the documentary Food Evolution. Uh -huh. And just as a point of disclosure, I lent my voice to the film. You are the narrator. <laughs> so I narrated the film. I didn't write it. I, I assisted in some sentences just to, for clarity. But well, no, that's I, cool. it's, it's, it's his project, and he found GMO scientists. And, and Well, no, your voice lends a certain credence to the, uh, to the subject matter oh, because yeah. you're, well, a, you're a, you're a well-known scientist and science educator, well, when, and everyone knows your voice. Well, when I, when I read the script, I said, okay, he's trying to get the truth out there, and that's all any scientist tries to do. Mm -hmm. Establish what is objectively true and share that. Wait a minute. Whether or not it agrees with any of your prior philosophies, that's all I'm saying. I heard what you guys were doing was trying to get that fat grant money so you could live it up and make it rain. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all the people living in mansions from grant money. Right, yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> so, Ooh, that National Science Foundation, <laughs> crazy with the money. Crazy money, crazy money. <laughs> My NSF yacht, <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, GMO, of course, is the abbreviation for genetically modified organisms. And you know it's not an acronym, just to make that clear. Okay. An acronym has to be pronounceable as a word. Right. So NASA is an acronym. Right. GMO is just a, an abbreviation. Right, because if you pronounce it, it'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Right. So I, I don't claim specific expertise. and I have general knowledge, but not specific expertise. And so anytime we're in that situation, we bring in someone who's got the expertise. So, an expert. So joining us by video call today is our guest, a plant geneticist, Pamela Ronald. Pamela, welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. So you study rice genetics at UC Davis, is that correct? I do. Now, I thought at UC Davis they just make wine. There's a huge wine school there at UC Davis. Uh, when you're doing a lot of research, you need to drink a little bit of wine now and then, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the relationship among the schools of study. I yes, like the okay. way you guys roll. <laughs> and you're a co-author of a book, Tomorrow's Table, Organic Farming, Genetics and the Future of Food. That's right. It's a book I wrote with my husband, who's an organic farmer. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, wow. So you're you're a plant geneticist. He's an organic. You're like the Romeo and Juliet of <laughs> biology. It's pretty cool. We're still alive, though. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, good. That's an yeah, important that's difference. An important difference. <laughs> right. You guys had a happy ending. I see. <laughs> so why don't we just start with basics here? And just tell us what is a GMO and how do you, how do you create them? Well, as you said, it's abbreviation for genetically modified organisms. And, you know, the term isn't really so useful for advancing discussions about sustainable agriculture. And that's because the term seems to me means something different to everyone. And the Food and Drug Administration has stated that it's scientifically meaningless. And that's because everything we eat, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, has been genetically altered in some manner. And so, for an example, some foods have been developed through a process of chemical or irradiation mutagenesis, which introduced random changes in the genome. Some are developed through conventional breeding or hybridization. And genetic engineering is a technique where you can take a gene from any species and put it into a plant. So you could take a gene from a virus, for example, and put it into a plant. So, so what you're saying is something I've known for a while, but it's good to hear it just sort of out of the horse's mouth here, that you, you know, we've been modifying organisms ever since the dawn of agriculture, mm -hmm. and, right? There, there are no herds of wild milk cows wandering the countryside. They, we invented a cow for our purposes, to get meat and to get milk. 
and and we we cultivate we usually cultivate, but it's really you're genetically changing corn from whatever cavemen ate to these big old sticks of corn that we now munch on. So this is true for essentially every food in the grocery store. Yeah, that's correct. And genetic engineering and a, another approach, genome editing, these are more modern tools, but we've been, it's been about 10,000 years of history and there's been changes along the way. Mendel discovered the genetic basis of inheritance. Um, farmers started mixing two species together through grafting. Uh, there's mutagenesis, hybridization. So there's many different types of techniques and genetic engineering has been around for 40 years um, and is one of the newer techniques. So they're, so they're distinguishing genetic engineering, which happens in a laboratory, from the genetic changes that were brought about through uh, crossbreeding and the history of this exercise going back to the dawn of agriculture. Well, that's partly true, but a lot of crops that organic farmers and other farmers grow have been developed in the laboratory. So it's not necessarily a laboratory step. There's not really a scientific reason for excluding genetically engineered crops from organic agriculture, but there's a historical reason. Why do we need GMOs at all? I mean, I know your answer, but I just want to just hear it. What is the so need for So it's not for? that we need so-called GMOs, but we need to advance sustainable agriculture. And there are many important tools that we need. And as I mentioned before, we need ecologically based farming practices, but we also need seed. That seed could be developed with many approaches, but for particular, there's some problems that have no real solution except genetic engineering. We know some insecticides are are very dangerous. So there's uh, the World Health Organization reports that 300,000 people die every year from overuse or misuse of insecticides, uh, mostly in less developed countries. They don't have um, safety measures that, that they can take. But what we do know is that every major scientific organization in the world, including the National Academy of Sciences, the European Food Safety Authority, and many other organizations have concluded that the process of genetic engineering is no more risky than conventional breeding. And in fact, genetic engineering has been used for 40 years. It's been used in cheeses, in medicine, and in crops. And there hasn't been a single case of harm to human health or the environment. So uh, uh, Scott, Scott Kennedy, okay, as a documentary filmmaker, I, I think generally documentarians lean left, politically left. Would you agree with that? Uh, you yeah, think about it? Yeah, for the most part. Yeah, for the most part. And he makes a film that is not anti-GMO. So this is kind of, whoa, what's, where's that, what, what's he thinking? Right, so, yeah. Uh, well, whenever, if, if, if you are a left-leaning documentarian who puts out a, uh, a work that is not critical of GMOs, then people are like, another one's been bought. Right, exactly, exactly. Well, Monsanto got to him too. So I, so I had to ask him, so I've got, I interviewed him for, okay. just for this purpose, and so I had to ask him, what was he thinking as someone who generally leans left in his politics and in his thinking, and definitely as a documentarian? So let's check out what he said. We wanted to make a film, oh, there's so many reasons why we wanted to make this film. One of the biggest ones was relieving anxiety, right? I've seen so many of my friends, so many of my neighbors, so many parents and mothers that have their shoulders like this. I know you can't see me on radio, but they have their shoulders up, again, up in their ears about food and where are they getting their information from and they're freaked out. So it's anxiety. Anxiety, yeah. And should we have that anxiety, right? That's the first question. Anxiety should, about food. Should we have anxiety about food, mm -hmm. right? And when we, uh, we kept doing the research, the overall science and data said we are living, we could not be living in a safer time uh, for, for our food, more abundant food, more nutritious food available to more people than we, than, than we are living in right now. And that's not being communicated by some of the smartest people that have the ear of, especially in a country like the United States, have the ear of the media. There's fear all over the place. Chemicals and pesticides and all of these things. Are some of those things in the food system? Absolutely, but risk assessment. So that was one of the biggest motivations. Can, I, can we make a film that talks about 
food and science and safety and sustainability, looking towards 9 billion people screaming at us by 2050, are we going to make our food system more sustainable and do it in a way that doesn't just give a hall pass to big food and big government and these other vague terms that, that are out there that have data that exists to say we need to be concerned about those things. Big profits and big greed can lead to problems. Does that mean the world is upside down and I shouldn't trust anybody and I shouldn't trust food and I shouldn't trust my government? No, that's what we found. Yeah, so, so Pamela, how do we, what's our evidence that uh, a genetically modified food stuff is, is safe? Because that's been a big issue out there, a big concern. And can we genetically modify food to lower anxiety? <laughs> Kill two birds with one stone on that one. Hey, man, while we're at it, why don't we get to it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Clean yeah. it all up. Yeah. Well, every crop must be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, whether it's genetically engineered or developed through mutagenesis. Um, but what we do know is that every major scientific organization in the world including the National Academy of Sciences, the European Food Safety Authority, and many other organizations have concluded that the process of genetic engineering is no more risky than conventional breeding. And in fact, genetic engineering has been used for 40 years. It's been used in cheeses, in medicine, and in crops. And there hasn't been a single case of harm to human health or the environment. And I think it's important to remember that these are the same organizations that most of us trust when it comes to the safety of vaccines or the effects of a cl changing climate. Oh, well, in that case, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can see it's very politicized. So the scientific consensus is very clear. It doesn't matter if you live in France or if you live in the United States the scientific community has reached a consensus. But you see that these different, um, these are three hot topics, vaccines, climate change, and so-called GMOs that have been extremely politicized, making it very, very difficult for consumers to really access accurate science-based information. So, so this distrust, this, this uh, anxiety, I always wondered like where it come, came from. Do, do scientists need better marketing people? I, I mean, yes. I, I, I don't know. So I, I asked Scott, I asked him, where does he think this anxiety comes from when normally these are people that would otherwise trust scientists and whatever is the consensus of observations and experiment. Yeah. So we chatted about that, check it out. We came to call it, we're living in an age of distrust. And in my simpleton historian way, I go back to Watergate as being the beginning of, of modern distrust, right? We have distrusted each other since caveman days, and we can get into that. But the effect that Watergate had, two, two effects that Watergate had, was seeing the ruthlessness of money and power and politics, how far they can go. We're like, oh, we didn't trust politicians a little bit, but this is another level. The second one, which is very interesting with the internet, is who saved us from what could have been the outcome of Watergate, Woodward and Bernstein, two journalists. Now cut to 2016, and the journalists that are on the internet, some of them brilliant and doing hard work and, and getting us a piece of information that the New York Times will never get to. And then there's a bunch of quacks that think they're Woodward and Bernstein trying to save the world and point out corruption. It's like they want to find the next controversy so they can go, see, corruption. They, they have to find the controversy. They have to find it. Whether or not it's there. That's right. Interesting analysis. And, and, it, and, and that, that anxiety... I'm surprised a lot of these people just even go outside. You know, if you follow through, you know what I'm saying? If you follow through on the level of anxiety they have, I'm like, so why aren't you under your bed right now? Because I, I would be if I believed what you believe. You'd be in your closet. I'd be. Yeah, well, I don't. I don't get it. You know, the unknown unknowns and all of this. I'm like, I, okay, there are tons of things that we don't know about, and there. But thankfully, there are many, many more things that we do have good information about, and we do know that if you're choosing to eat a traditionally produced vegetable, they would call that big ag, versus an organically produced vegetable, which is more important, and my friend and doctor 
John Schwartzberg at the Berkeley Wellness Letter, somebody trying to communicate good science, said, it's much more important to eat the vegetable than determine between those two vegetables, right? Eat the vegetable. Eat the frozen vegetable. Eat the canned vegetable. Eat your vegetables. Sorry. <laughs> got on a mini you got some buttons there. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Pamela, do we, just, we, do we just eat our vegetables? Let's solve all the problems. It'll solve a lot of problems. It's not always easy to do. I have a 16-year-old daughter. Getting her to eat vegetables is not so easy. And then there's places in much of the world where children don't have access to vegetables. So, but if you can eat your fruits and vegetables, that's that's important. But still, you know, I know um, because of my husband that farming is challenging, whether it's a big farm or a small farm, farmers face a lot of challenges and they need um, the best tools available. So all farmers, whether you're an organic farmer or a large conventional farmer, you need to have access to genetically improve uh, crop varieties, as well as uh, good farming practices and government policies. Is it possible to be an organic farmer of genetically modified foods? So according to the National Organic Program Standards, if you want to be certified organic, you cannot grow genetically engineered crops. However, you can grow crops that have been developed through mutagenesis or hybridization. You can buy your seed from Monsanto. You could do pretty much everything in terms of planting genetically improved seeds, except you cannot, for example, plant the genetically engineered papaya that I know you're going to talk about on your show and be certified organic. There's a serious insect that can destroy an entire eggplant crop in Bangladesh if, if it's not controlled. An eggplant is the most important vegetable in Bangladesh. So to control this disease, farmers spray chemical insecticides two to three times a week. And But we know some insecticides are are very dangerous. So there's uh, the World Health Organization reports that 300,000 people die every year from overuse or misuse of insecticides, uh, mostly in less developed countries. They don't have um, safety measures that, that they can take. Um, so Bangladeshi and Cornell scientists decided to try to control this insect using a genetic approach that builds on an organic farming strategy. So organic farmers will spray a pesticide called BT on crops to control um, various types of insect uh, infections. And they use it because it's un not harmful to humans or wildlife or, or fish. And in fact, it's less toxic than, than table salt. But the problem is in Bangladesh, it's very difficult to get this um, insecticide. It's expensive and it doesn't prevent the insect from getting inside the plant. So what the Bangladeshi and Cornell scientists did was they took that gene from the bacteria and they entered it directly into the eggplant. And it's been really very uh, effective in the last three years, farmers that are growing this eggplant can reduce their insecticides dramatically, often down to zero. And they could self the seed and replant it um, the next season. It's, it's a public domain uh, seed. You've been listening to Star Talk, and I've been your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. Chuck Nice, as always, Such thanks for doing this, and thanks to, to Pamela Ronald for being on the show. And as always, I bid you to keep looking up. Thank <laughs> you.